the pianolist's work is not really recognised in concerts. People don't understand what you're doing. Mm. It's all in here, and the movements that you're making are really very subtle. You're listening to Finding Pieces, a podcast on pianos, people and music. Hi everyone, welcome to the seventh episode on season one of Finding Pieces. My name is Joyce and I'm the host of Finding Pieces. This episode is a special guest episode and we're joined by the world's renowned pianola player, Rex Lawson. Rex has been playing the pianola for over half a century and has been traveling the world to play with different orchestras and musicians. Talking with Rex on and off the camera has been extremely insightful into not only the world of pianola, but also how he journeyed as a musician. So much was said and I decided to take this in two parts and this episode is part one where Rex talks about his journey as a pianola player. There are a few questions that I asked and I've included these in the timestamps in the comments below. I didn't include much musical examples in this episode because Rex has his own YouTube channel so do check out his performances there. And Rex is also the founder of the Pianola Institute a website full of informative information about player pianos and player organs. Let's get to the interview. When I first came to the pianola, it was the mechanism which mm. attracted me. But it did have the bonus that it was a musical instrument. And so there was some musical pleasure to be had from it. I mean, I studied music. I studied the piano when I was little. My parents both played the piano. They played four hands quite a lot together. My father and my mother had all brothers as siblings. And particularly on my mother's side, they were very mechanically minded. Mm. And somewhere I've got a photograph of myself at about the age of three, which I think my uncle took, with me with a big screwdriver in my hand, <laughs> taking an iron to pieces to see how it worked. And I always enjoyed doing that. Uh, in my teens, I was uh, a radio amateur, mm. and you had to pass electronics things to be able to get a license for that. And I went to Nottingham University, where I took a music degree, music and French, actually, I do remember that at school in an old old um, cinema it was, in the corner there was the old projection room. Somebody had stored three old upright pianolas in there. None of them worked and I was a bit curious. In the, golly, it would be about 1969, I think, um, I lived about three miles away from the university in a half a house which I shared with two other students and to walk home each night I had to walk past Nottingham station and right next to the station was um, an antique shop and there was an upright Weber I think it was player piano which was 150 pounds mm. and that was vastly expensive I couldn't possibly afford that in 1969 you can I mean it would be a great deal more than that 10 times mm. I should think probably in the, these days but I was fascinated by it and I used to stare you know press my nose to the window and have a look through it the lovely instrument and the rolls on top of it of course um, but it wasn't for me and then um, the professor's wife she came and found me one day and said Rex I've seen another pianola in the Derby Road in a junk shop and they're asking £12 for it, you wow. see. So I thought, wow, I'll, I'll go along and have a look at that. And I did go and it was a 65-note upright stack and I sat down in front of it and pedalled and I got this crunching noise out of the pedals and no music at all, just some bangs. And the guy in the shop said, all right, then, he said... Uh, you can have it for six quid, uh, but you've got to arrange your own transport. <laughs> Discount, yeah. <laughs> so um, I got all my friends in the university music department and went off to the junk shop and we lifted this thing bodily and got it onto a van which I'd rented oh. and drove it back. 
and I knew nothing about piano trolleys in those days. I was completely innocent, so it was extraordinarily heavy. Yeah. And we got it back. It was February, if I remember rightly, um, and there was a long gravelly path to get to the front of the house. So it was a question of lifting it six inches and then dropping it down again. Um, and we got to the front door, which was a sort of mini conservatory, and the door was too narrow for the piano to go through. So there was a real panic, and I got a plastic tarpaulin, which I had used for my mini, my mini car that I had, um, and it was large enough to go over this piano. So I put a brick on each corner to stop it blowing away, because we were somewhere near to the top of a hill. Um, and I used to come out when I wasn't working, when I was at home in the evenings, I would run my hands under hot water to try and keep them warm, rush outside with a screwdriver and try and discover how this awful thing came to pieces. And then it took, I can't remember, it took between three and six weeks to get it to pieces. I would know how to do it now, of course. What was it like the first time it made music and what did you play? <laughs> I can time. tell you exactly. I can tell you absolutely. Well, I th yes, I can, I think. But I should say, when I left university, um, I stayed in Nottingham because I got a job running, um, well, not being in charge of, but, but being the, the slave who ran the orchestra under the direction of the conductor. Um, it happened that I was... I, I, I should say that uh, with as part of my duties with the orchestra, I used to go down to the local radio station, Radio Nottingham, which was pretty much new in the year that I started at the orchestra. It was the early 1970s, and local radio was just getting going at that stage. And I got to know the people down there, and I would go and chat about the repertoire that the orchestra was playing and which towns it was doing its concerts in around Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire and so on. And I must have mentioned at some point to somebody, I just got hold of this pianola and it was fascinating. And, you know, uh, radio engineers are going to be interested in that sort of thing anyway. And so it was in the back of their mind that I had one. And I got a phone call and they said, somebody in an old vicarage in East Retford had found some music rolls under the floorboards. And so local radio wanted to make a news item of that the next morning. And I said to them, look, I've got it indoors. I've got it sort of reassembled vaguely, but I haven't yet connected the tubes up that go from the tracker bar to the notes. And they were all hanging down. They were all old black tube. And I got them. They were squashed flat. And I got some paper clips and push them over that to open the tubes up. And then I had to try and work out where each tube went. And I sort of got part of it right, but not all of it. <laughs> so the first roll that I pedaled properly on that pianola was a piece called Whistling Rufus. Um, and a bit like Eric Morecambe, I played all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> um, and it went out on Radio Nottingham the next oh, morning. <laughs> Effectively, I think it's fair enough to say that I started um, the idea of public concerts mm. after the war. That's not quite true, because there was a concert in Los Angeles in 1963 mm. when they used a movement of the Stravinsky Concerto for Piano and Winds, and they, got, they used his role mm. for the first movement, because he only, or at least they only published the first movement, so that's the only one that survived. Um, but really, I, I persuaded the orchestra I was working with to do a concert with Percy Granger doing the Greek Piano Concerto, mm -hmm. using the roles, and that introduced me to the Musical Museum in Brentford, mm -hmm. um, who were the only people that I knew who had copies of those roles. Mm -hmm. By virtue of getting in touch with Brentford and coming and meeting Frank Holland, I, I discovered very, very many more roles. But Frank's whole enthusiasm was for automatic instruments. He really wasn't very concerned about pedaled roles. 
Um, it was the reproducing piano rolls and the orchestrians and all the rest of it that that he was interested in. So I took my lead from him at that stage and I um, and it seemed to me I believed the lie which was put around from over a hundred years ago really that the foot pedal player piano was really the poor man of the um, of the musical world and that reproducing pianos were much more important and I don't now think that's the case I think they have an equal importance in different ways they Did you have... still secretly practice some rolls yourself and try to pedal? I did do a little bit of it I can remember um, one of the things which I was keen to do just for the hell of it um, when we were doing, we started doing a number of Purcell Room concerts. There were, there were some roles which had two pianists on. And I wanted to be able to play those on two duarts, two pianos. So I devised a system with electrical relays um, and a role reader off stage which made electrical contacts when it read the role um, so that you could run hundred-way cables from the back room at the Purcell room onto the stage and get two pianos to play simultaneously and I started out thinking well you know one piano can go up to the E flat above middle C and the other one can do the treble side um, but then I thought no that isn't good enough you've got to have individual notes mm. so it was really quite a complicated system when it finished with extra well holes that were being used at the edge of the roll to blank off other holes and then those in different coded ways um, you could switch every pair of notes every semitone pair of notes from either notional bass or notional treble so you could send these two channels to the pianos um, in um, in real time and you could get two pianos apparently to play in perfect synchronism I and mean, all the editing was done with razor blades in those days um, the magic flute overture the fugato bit in magic flute is bom, 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 bom. And that's the point at which the second piano comes in so it goes and in between the pot and the pot, um, you had to switch the relays across so that it went from one piano to the next. And by getting it exactly right, it just did. Um, so you were controlling two pianos? Well, I, well, I wasn't really, well, in a sense, controlling. We were sitting off stage, or I was on stage, um, because I was presenting the show. But um, the role ran automatically on the role reader. And because of the various pilot holes and all the rest of it that I'd cut in, it went automatically from one to the next. And the people from the player piano group were livid. Well, they, um, people generally in the player piano world were fairly irritated, I think, um, because they thought it was a gimmick. Um, and, and mainly because they didn't know how we did it. They thought we must be using two rolls and some because the hands crossed, of course, um, but we weren't. We were using just the one. How did you practice the rolls in which you pedal? Well, I didn't at that stage because I didn't reckon I, I didn't reckon that you could play the pianola musically in in the early seventies. I mean, it took to the late seventies for me to realise that. I mean, I there were two important points in my life. One was that I went to a player piano group concert at the Purcell Room. And there was a pianola player called Fritz Lang and he played something in a way that I didn't realise you could do on the pianola. And the other very significant moment was meeting Dennis, meeting Dennis Hall who's my best friend and um, I was doing a concert in Paris in 1981 and he came over specially for that along with another friend 
and we hit it off, he and Dennis and I, and he has such an encyclopedic knowledge of historic pianism, and he decided when he retired, particularly in 1993, um, to concentrate on reproducing pianos, mm. and listening to the performances on roll um, has been a revelation, and so that was something that that changed my life and I fell in love with that style of performance. I mean, there are many different styles because all the pianists are different, of course, but they are much more different between each other mm. than pianists generally are nowadays. They're much more uniform nowadays. Mm. So the subtleties between the differences of different music roles you gradually discovered after 1970s. <laughs> When, yes. when you yes. uh, when you were inspired by the concert of the pianolis. I I had heard Fritz Lang playing at the Purcell Room, but then um, that got me interested in or realizing that there was a lot to be done with foot pedaling. Um, and I wanted to try that. And then I met somebody must have told me about Bill Candy. Um, who was um, an elderly member of the player piano group, um, about four or five years older than I am now. Um, and my father used to take the Musical Times and Musical Opinion. Um, so he had Musical Times is going back to the teens of the 20th century. Um, there was somebody called William Delessere. And I'd been reading really pretty decent reviews of new music roles and so on. And I discovered when I went round to see Bill Candy that he was William Delessere. And to be meeting somebody who'd been writing music role reviews in the mid-1920s, I mean, it never occurred to me that he would still be alive. I assumed that William Delessere had died many years before. But there he was all of a sudden, and he'd been a young man, obviously, when when he'd written her his review, he was a real enthusiast. Um, and we became friends. I didn't have his friendship for very long because he died in his early 80s. Um, but we used to sit there and talk about the history of the player piano. We used to chat about all these sort of things and he'd played the Greek concerto with the insurance orchestra mm -hmm. at the Scala Theatre in London in 1930, he said. Never found a trace of that in the press. Mm. And he was a, I should say, he was a demonstrator, which is not a very nice word, but somebody who played the Fanola, solo Fanola for Blutness, who were the main Hochfeld agents in mm. London. Um, so he learned uh, part of his living doing that when he was young. Um, so he was, he was a very accomplished player pianist. He wasn't somebody who'd got so far with the pianola. He stayed with Hochfeld, and there was another type he had where he could just end up at the top note with a complete whisper. He could just get the note to whisper, which is obviously one of the most difficult things um, with a pianola. But by the time I met him, he couldn't really pedal much anymore because he got arthritis and things like that, if I remember rightly. Um, so I used to play a bit when I went round there. Mm, yeah. And he was getting older. And at a certain point, he brought up the subject one day that he wanted to pass his roles on. Mm. And he wanted me to have them. And it was overwhelming that, that um, for Bill to give me his roles. And he knew very well that I would do the best by them and that, you know, we talked about founding a Pianola Institute and so on. It's mm -hmm. where the idea came from, chatting with him. Those are probably the two... Trans the two most transforming moments. Yes, I mean... Uh, the largest life-transforming moment has been meeting Rona, my wife, in 2000, which 
appropriately enough, was at a concert where we were both performing. So that worked out very well. Um, seen that fairly strongly, mm. and that one, but that's already late. And that's that's the one. Just judging by the music, that's the one that needs to be loud, mm. not that one. Uh, and it's, of course, it's very late there. What is the most challenging piece you think ever to play on the pianola? Um, there are a number of them, um, and for differing reasons. Um, my experience has been that conductors, when they're conducting an ensemble, which includes a pianola, get very nervous about the pianola uh, because they think, oh, the pianola is never going to stay in time. Huh? I mean, it's impossible to control a pianola, they think. Um, so the result of that is that they pay far too much attention to the pianola. And so the tiniest little movement in a rehearsal, you know, if they think you're not in quite, they'll start to worry and panic, whereas they wouldn't do that with any other instrument. Mm. Um, so the other instruments can get away with much more than a pianola player can. So you really, really have to be on your toes to follow absolutely um, until after the first or second rehearsal they start to relax. You need somebody who has a little bit more confidence um, and is prepared, to, uh, is prepared to trust you. And I was going to say... The first big concert I did overseas was in 1981 with Pierre Boulez mm. when we did Les Nos, which in those days was the premiere of that version, in Paris. And he managed to... I think he just assumed, having met me, he assumed everything would be all right. Mm. And it was, um, as far as I can tell. Um, and in fact, there is a funny little story which I wanted to tell you about that particular concert it's one which Dennis came over for that's when I first met Dennis properly um, which is that um, I arrived there I think on a Tuesday with the concert on the Friday it was supposed to be and um, I got into maybe I got there on the Monday night I don't remember but I turned up anyway at the radio the day after I arrived uh, with my pianola and the roll and so well, a couple of rolls and they said, OK, what does it sound like? And I, first of all, I played a Chopin study and they were all going ooh and ah and so on. And he said, right, that's all very good, you know, but now I want you to play the Stravinsky. So I played the Stravinsky and, uh, and it was one that I'd made, took me, I think it was three months, it was a long time to make, with razor blade, single-sided razor blade. Um, and he listened to it and he said... That's absolutely fine, he said. Um, I don't need you now until um, the day before the concert. For the um, So take two days off, you know, go and look at Paris and so on. It was great. Um, and then I went back for probably a couple of rehearsals, I think, the day before. And then there was, I guess, there was a rehearsal on the morning and then concert in the evening. Um, and... When you're rehearsing, I mean, he, he stopped the rehearsal in different places, but not because of me, but simply because there was something else he wanted the chorus to do or the other instrumentalists and so on. Um, and the first time he did it, because he wasn't really worried, he just, you know, he said, let's go, in, in French, let's go back to letter C or whatever. And he raised his hand already, and I said, uh, mestre, uh, maître, um, and then, of course, it, he realised I had to re-roll to get there because I didn't know where he was going to go back to. And I would mark up the roll with the bar numbers and the 
rehearsal letters and things. Um, so all of a sudden he realised, and Boulez was an exceptionally clever man, um, but he was gentle and he was understanding, and he obviously regarded it as the duty of a good conductor to be aware of the unique difficulties that different instrumentalists faced when they played their instruments. So he clocked then that he had to take care when he said, let's go to letter so-and-so. Mm. And after that, he turned round, looked for a moment and said, Monsieur Lawson? And I'd say, oui, oui, okay, and so on. But you get used to how far a conductor's going to go back. Yes. So each time he stopped, inevitably to save time, I was just sort of moving the role back a little bit. And on one occasion, I'd obviously gone back to the right place and I was ready. But he didn't know that. So he turned around and by that stage, he wasn't saying Monsieur Lawson. He just looked at me like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I looked at him like that. <laughs> and he, he yelled out over the whole orchestra, Ah! You are fantastic, he said. <laughs> and the fun of that, um, I mean, obviously, I put that in my, in my reviews, my press reviews or whatever, but the fun of that was the personal fun. It was just, you know, he had a decent sense of humour and so did I, and we just enjoyed ourselves. And it was this real feeling of togetherness. Mm. And he remained, I have to say, he remained a friend albeit a distant one that I didn't see very much. The other difficult works, George Antal's Bunny Mechanique is quite difficult, um, but you're dependent very much on the conductor uh, and you need clarity and awareness on the part of the conductor and then you're all right. The most difficult pieces, you would say, is ensemble, particularly... With that orchestra. sort of music, but the most difficult work. Um, Conlon Nancaro was, got, was intending to write a concerto um, for me to play with a chamber ensemble of about 17, 18 instruments. And he never finished it. Um, there are many reasons for that, one of which was that he was getting older and not, and he was getting rather ill, and so he, it, it just didn't happen. But what happened after that was that a British composer, Paul Usher, who has, is unrecognised, I would say, in this country, and he's given up composing, he wrote something called Nankara Concerto, and he went over to Basel, to the Sachstiftung, where they have all Conlon's roles and manuscripts and things. And he took every single little bit of a sketch, which he worked out was for that concerto, and he included it, but it was in his own work. Mm. And he used it in a different way from what Conlon had done. So it, it, although it has one of the movements in particular is very much like Conlon, some of it's very different. Mm. Um, and it's very complex. And every, I mean, like in the Antile, any more so. Mm. Um, you have bars which are of different lengths and the accents that you have to put in are nothing to do with beats um, they come in the middle of goodness knows where so you're having to and you you have to I mean uh, th there was a certain point where I had changed role and I had to come in at exactly the same time as the trumpets I think and it was completely offbeat in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and we had a lot of trouble with that not you know, sometimes that was my not getting it right and sometimes it was the trumpets not getting it right. Mm. Um, but that that is a an extremely difficult work and I, I worry for its future. Mm. Um, we did a recording of it, but they made it into a concerto for orchestra mm. with a pianola somewhere in the background. And that was not what Paul intended. But as he sadly said to me at the recording session, you know, who are we? You're just the pianola player, I'm just the composer. Mm. We don't have any say in this. It's the engineer who decides what he wants to do. Do you think there's quite a lot of misconception about the pianola for a lot of musicians? Yes, even? yes. Oh, uh, musicians and the rest, people who run music. The pianolists 
work is not really recognised in concerts. People don't understand what you're doing. Mm. It's all in here, and the movements that you're making are really very subtle. I mean, one of my biggest sadnesses here with regard to that is the BBC. Since 1988, the BBC have avoided taking the player piano seriously, with one wonderful exception, which was that the uh, com the producer of the BBC Singers commissioned a piece called Airplane Cantata for the singers and pianola. Um, but apart from that, they really haven't done much at all, and it's been a huge lost opportunity. In, in 2009, um, at least when the previous control of music had left, um, a guy called Roger Wright took over, and I'd known Roger since the 1970s when he ran the British Music Information Centre just off Oxford Street. Um, and so I thought when I suggested maybe finally they could do something with the piano at the proms, that he might be sympathetic to that. And in his eyes he was, because he chose uh, to stage a concert of multiple pianos and other instruments as well. Um, but he used works that had been inspired by the player piano or were intended for it, but in versions which excluded it. Mm because he obviously thought you couldn't possibly have a player piano on the stage in the proms because it would be so unmusical, I suppose, is what he thought. Um, and I saw him and I said, you know, it really was rather disappointed. And he was very surprised to learn that. And then they said, uh, well, tell you what, we'll have a, a roundtable discussion before the concert and you can take part if you like, and maybe give a five minute demonstration of the pianola. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, look, or I, I wrote back by email to whoever had been in touch with me, um, I'm not a vacuum cleaner salesman, I'm a musician, I don't demonstrate, I simply play. Mm -hmm. And I don't do things for five minutes. They wouldn't ask any other musician in the world to do that. Mm -hmm. They really wouldn't. Um, and so in the end, they as they would have seen it, they caved in and said, all right, well, you can do a recital before the prom um, and you can present it. Mm. And when the prom's brochure came out many months later, I discovered that one of their Radio 3 presenters was presenting it mm. um, and they offered a very low fee mm. um, for an, an enormous amount of work. And I insisted that Dennis uh, should play, we should both do it together. Mm. Um, because I'm sure otherwise in the main prom programme they would have come up with the silly excuse that you can't synchronise pianolas with other instruments, mm. which is why they couldn't use the pianola in the actual prom. Mm. And of course that's rubbish, of course you can. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I suspect, I, I should think by these by this time, they don't even think about such things. I don't think they consider the player piano, the foot pedal player piano, as a as a viable musical instrument at all. I just don't think it enters their heads, mm. and I don't quite know how to get round that. I mean, I have tried over the years, but it just hasn't worked. Mm. So all my big concerts have tended to be abroad. Final questions to ask you, Rex. The first one is, what are your thoughts on the current state of this art form? The pianola reproducing piano? I have to be very careful what I allow myself to think because I am all too well aware that as you get older, you look at something which has been such a huge part of your life and generations change and values change and I can't expect anybody to take over if you like I mean not that I own it but I can't expect anybody to carry on with the player piano in exactly the way that I have and it would be very easy to say oh well it won't be as fulfilling or true as I mean that that truth is one thing I'm 
I am quite keen on. And the trouble is that a lot of people in, in the last 50 years have written books about player pianos and they haven't been writing them in order to be truthful. They've been writing them in order to make money and to make nice coffee table books that people could look at. And they very often get things wrong. But because they're in book form and they've got ISBN numbers nowadays, people think they must be true. Mm. And then they will repeat, people will repeat what they read in these books or on the backs of record sleeves. And those will be in peer-reviewed theses that they repeat this stuff. Mm. And because that's then peer-reviewed, it gets passed down the line and it gets increasingly difficult to re-establish the truth. And Sometimes the truth is difficult to find, though, because if you have a lack of expertise on the knowledge and you have instruments which are fading and deteriorating, yes. and materials which are deteriorating, the only thing that we can rely on is publications. Yes, but to a degree press. you can find out from those, you can work out in those publications, you can work a certain amount of things out because they can't possibly be true. And you, you came up with something yesterday, which um, is another good example, um, that the Erlin Company at some point uh, took a concert that Chaminade had done in 1910 mm -hmm. and said she was the first famous artist um, renowned artist to play with or to pianola. or to perform, I think they said, along with a pianola. Mm -hmm. Well, she wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, they had people um, going way back to the beginning of the 1900s mm -hmm. who sang, very important singers indeed, and indeed in the 1890s, the late 1890s, um, stars from the Metropolitan Opera who went along and sang with the Aeolian and the pianola. I've documented thousands of concerts with player pianos, mm -hmm. mainly that the Erlin Company put on in Manhattan because it's an easy subject to research because there are so many newspapers around. Mm -hmm. By doing that and by getting that ground information um, in some sort of shape, it allows you to get a little bit closer to the truth. The other worry I have Two, a, a two-part worry. One is that knowledge of the reproducing piano is not, is not good enough amongst musicologists. And as I was saying before we started this talk, um, I think it should be an almost compulsory part of wanting to study the player piano mm. that you have to do some technical work. Um, because that's the best way of coming to understand how the pianos work, knowing what they're capable of and knowing for the future um, the standards that you need to work to. With regard to the normal foot pedal player piano, um, my personal preference would be to see people doing it for the love of it because it's a wonderful instrument. Mm. And I'm not convinced that happens. I think, well, I think mainly most people, I think, I have to say at the moment, I think musicologists, all of a sudden, as this movement has taken off, um, I mean, it's quite surreal, you know, the fact that you're interviewing me at all. Um, it, I mean, this simply doesn't happen in my life, not like this. Um, so the whole line, and, and you know, I go to a conference and people come round and ask questions and all the rest of it. I'm, I'm sort of aware of that, but it is a very strange situation. Um, but I have a feeling that musicologists are looking at what I do and thinking, first of all, thinking, oh, well, that's quite easy. I, I'll be able to do that. And then when they start working it out, they start thinking, ah... It's not as easy as I thought. And perhaps to a degree they give up and think, oh, well, I'm going to stick with the reproducing pianos and not do the pianolas. Because the idea, I mean, if nothing else, keeping in time with another musician, especially when it's on the hoof, when it's, you know, when you don't quite know where the performance is going to go, um, that takes a lot of getting used to. And I would like to see people doing that 
I do see things on YouTube, but all too often there's a feeling of, I'll get a shot for this, but there is a feeling of arrogance around of people putting things on YouTube for sort of self-justification, posting things like this, seem to say, this is how it should be, this, I find, you know, this is perfect and so on. And it clearly isn't. Mm. Um, and it needs more honesty. As, as I said to you, I'm putting out a whole load of Scriabin roles, roles that Scriabin played, um, but with no dynamics. I will, in the introductions, I will simply say I've done the best I can mm. and that I will never be happy with any of the performances that I've helped to create. But nevertheless, I've done my best. And But I wish, in general terms, that people would take it up mm. because it's a lovely instrument and there are bits of the repertoire that will die mm. otherwise and that, that worries me a great deal. Yeah, I mean, you've partly answered my second question is... Obviously, the future is uncertain, but if you can contribute to its change, how do you wish your legacy to continue? I never really thought of myself having a legacy. I suppose when it comes down to it, it boils down to an attitude to life as much as anything else. Most of the enjoyment, or a lot of the enjoyment, with playing the pianola is playing in intimate surroundings um, or after the concert chatting to people and just explaining how it works and so on. And it's nice to be able to explain technically how it works, but the main thing is it's human contact mm. um, and not keeping yourself on some sort of platform mm. um, and, and the audience is somehow down there and whatnot. Um, so I... I I don't know. I just I hope a lot of this music and musical tradition that I've been lucky enough to share can continue. Mm. Um, and the sooner there might be a, a school of playing the pianola, the better, actually, um, which is possibly one reason <laughs> why <in> that... <laughs> Because I don't think many universities are, have got that in mind. Mm. Um, and it would be nice nice to feel that at least uh, one or two could take on that challenge. Yeah.